uh, everyone on board uh, tonight with the session and night number 19 uh, from Saving Lives Academy and Anesthesia and Critical Care Refresher course. Um, tonight, as usual, we have one uh, lecture in anesthesia and the other one in ICU. Uh, the session uh, moderator tonight is Professor uh, Mohammed Ibrahim. Uh, just to let you know, the early bird registration for uh, anesthesia, sorry, for uh, critical care ultrasound uh, updates conference is closing by the end of this month. So uh, please do not miss uh, this chance for the early bird. We did that in particular for our colleagues in Egypt to make it reduced fees. Uh, after that, we are targeting the international uh, groups with the uh, regular fees. Uh, so uh, now I'm giving the mics to Professor uh, Mohammed Ibrahim. Uh, please uh, take over the session moderation, Dr. Mohammed, and uh, go ahead with your guests. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we'll start our uh, present our uh, night with uh, Dr. Walid Ali. Dr. Walid is a fellow in the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthesia. He's a senior staff of anesthesia, Werbury Mercy Hospital in Victoria. He's a senior staff specialist of anesthesia at Mount Camp, Gambia, South Australia. He's examiner and senior lecturer in University of Queensland and Flinders University of South Australia. We will talk tonight about the anesthesia for urology procedures. Fadali, uh, Dr. Please, your mic. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. And um, I always start my talk um, with the uh, quote that nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so, with the aim of promoting people to think about everything we do. When we work in any specialty, special, especially in anesthetics, it becomes like um, a second nature, but very important to, to know that this is not an apprenticeship. This, there is a lot of science behind everything we do, and it's very important to put thoughts in each and everything because there is no one size fits all. The, the talk today is going to cover um, anesthesia for uh, urology patients, and um, it's rather like a discussion about what we normally do in urology cases. And um, I'm, I'm probably going to add some fine tuning stuff and share some of the tips that I have gained through the years with you guys. It's more of a discussion about how everyone does things differently. Um, and uh, the aim of this talk is to ensure that everyone is absolutely comfortable with any list of urology. And also because the uh, urology lists are very unique, so this is an opportunity for all of us to make the most out of the urology cases in case of understand and appreciate the depth and the versatility of the um, cases presented. At the end of this talk, it will be easy for everyone to plan a very good episode of anesthetic care and be empowered enough to deliver that episode of care. There will be some uh, topics that we will discuss, uh, things like maintaining the patient's dignity. Urology case, cases or the uh, urology list is very private because you can't access the urological system except via the um, private parts. So it's kind of very important to patients and patients can be a little bit sensitive about it. I have genuine interest in education and sharing my experience with my colleagues. And I would really appreciate if uh, Walid, um, the, um, the, the moderator of this course, um, gives me an opportunity to offer all candidates a free um, version of a free copy of my two books. There are two books that I've published um, for the candidates attending the primary 
FANSCA exam, the Fellowship of the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. One, one book is um, about physiology, and, um, and, the, the, uh, and, and the other book is about pharmacology and statistics. It's, this will help candidates who are attending exams, whether it's an Australian exam or an overseas exam. It's structured in a way that helps people to think again. And um, it's absolutely free. Just contact Dr. Walid El Habashi. Exams. And we just discussed the aim of this uh, talk and how at the end of this talk, everyone will be comfortable with running urology cases and we will share together some of the uh, um, tips and the fine tuning of the practice of anesthetics for, for um, urology cases. So, during this talk, we will, during this talk, we will share some of the points that we need to reflect upon and uh, because urology patients uh, are quite sensitive and uh, their dignity, the, 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 like paying attention to their dignity is absolutely paramount. So let's start with a, ref a reflection. There will be few reflections during this talk. The first reflection here is everyone just think about the cases of urology that you have done in the past. How often do we pay attention to patients' dignity. There's four options. Do we do that all the time? Do we do that sometimes? Do we do that when the logistics allows us to do so? Or rather, what for? And why do we need to do that? So please answer the take, make an option in the poll that's coming now live for you. Th thank you so much, everyone for those who um, is, are always paying attention to patients' dignity and those who reminded themselves that it's something that should go up a little bit on their priority list. Um, because at the end of the day, we're public servants and we need to serve the public in the best possible manner. On any urology list, depends on the country that you practice in, there will be a, a versatile number of cases so it could be simply a circumcision case or could be uh, what we call truss biopsy, transrectal ultrasound biopsy of the prostate, or it could be a TURP or TURPT, which is transurethral resection of a bladder tumor, which is interestingly only happens in smokers. I don't think I've ever seen uh, a bladder tumor in someone who doesn't smoke. The list also would include uh, cystoscopies, whether it's rigid cystoscopy or um, flexible cystoscopy. There will be uh, cases of kidney stones, either done uh, in traditional way or done uh, using laser. Uh, there is also some cases in, in the urology list, like the bigger ones, which would be like a nephrectomy. And um, I'll be interested uh, in your reflection to, to, to put some thoughts and see wh wh how your institute does that. Is it laparoscopic assisted? And remind ourselves that with the nephrectomy, it, it's, it's quite a big scar if it's not laparoscopic assisted. And there is issues with positioning. So very important to get the dynamics of this list and also the uh, evolving and now gaining popularity, the robotic prostatectomy which is pretty much overtaking the uh, traditional prostatectomy or all the benefits that um, patients get and benefit from, especially maintaining um, erectile function and being discharged uh, quickly after uh, from the hospital. So we'll do now the second reflection. And you will notice that during this talk, it, the, it will be like flowing smoothly from one item to the other and covering all the, uh, the topics that we would like to discuss today. So here is our second reflection. In my institute, think nephrectomy is done as open procedure or rather as a laparoscopic assisted procedure. Well, it's very interesting that the open procedure is still uh, 
more than 50%. Uh, but I see the trend is heading more towards laparoscopic assisted procedure. And maybe it's something that we can discuss with our urology colleagues to, um, reflect, to help our patients. Most, the, what's very specific about the uh, urology list, it's, it's honestly by far one of the very best lists that you can ever do. It does include everything we've trained to do in anesthetics in terms of it has general anesthetic, you can do sedation, you can do spinal, you can do spinal with sedation. And because our talk here is also targeting candidates for attending exams, so I like to share this mnemonic about the spinal. So if we, we, in, in our exams, when we ask someone, how do you do your spinals? You don't dwell straight away and talk about the technique. It's always important to step a little bit back and get the helicopter view and talk about the whole episode of care. So how do you do your spinal? It's very simple and simple with a C, not an S, because this mnemonic stands for I obtain consent and then I insert IV access. Then I put my monitoring, that's for the M, and then I position the P, the patient, and then I administer my local anesthetic. This is the time to talk about the local anesthetic. And the technique is not finished without an evaluation, which is the E component of it. So in any sort of um, exam answer or in any case of sharing an experience, it's very important to maintain the helicopter view and be able to like, give a, 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 um, a helicopter view and an and opinion about the technique itself. So it's uh, C-I-M-P-L-E. And aesthetic, um, uh, the, the urology lists are very interesting because you're, you'll always be running an anesthetic list and there will be a parallel list happening by this, at the same time, maybe in another room where the urologist is doing his local anesthetic for flexible cystoscopies. So you might come on the list and find like 25 patients, 15 of them are um, local anesthetics, and the other ones are your cases that you'll be doing. So it's kind of, um, we have to work in harmony with the surgeon. Uh, some institutes run them like one GA and one local, one GA, one local, to keep things um, going. Urology list, one of the criteria of it is it does have a very high turnover. So there's no way you could start this list without having an assistant with you. This assistant can be anything, can be a medical student, can be an intern, a resident, a registrar, whichever you're lucky to have on the day. And it's actually a, like a win-win situation. So when you have an assistant, he will keep this high turnover list going and the, the person giving the assistance also have some expectations to be able to be a little bit more independent. I see that one urology list is enough to, to help the, the, the trainee to have like an upslope, a massive upslope in his experience. So you can show him the first one or two or three GAs and then they can continue to do that. So it's actually um, like a, a, a gold mine for teaching. So <clears throat> what I find, sorry, what I find that most candidates, most trainees love to do it because they get lots of independence quickly and they learn massively during these lists. Um, it does also, the urology list has lots of financial consideration and we have to be um, aware about this. These patients, it, it, both financial uh, consideration to us and to the patient. It's financially rewarding for an ethicist because high turnover and especially if you're doing it in private and if you are doing it smoothly with your urologist, he would definitely, definitely want to have you over and over again. You'll be his preferred anesthetist. And it also has some financial implications for patients because these patients are kind of frequent flyers. They, they, they come for chick cystoscopy. They come for chick, uh, uh, to check on the uh, TURP at time or TURPT. So these patients are really, you see them more than once. And that helps with the flow of the list because it, your anesthetic assessment is pretty much cheating looking on the previous anesthetic notes. And yeah, I've seen this patient before. They become like, uh, especially if you're practicing in, in a small community, 
it, it, they become like family. You see them again and, oh, yeah, yeah, you're coming for your procedure. It's also considering um, that you see them a lot and, and these patients are quite sensitive about their private parts and um, they share very intimate um, history with you. So very, very important to be considerate for the social factors of it, whether this is someone coming for a circumcision because this is his second marriage, for example, uh, in countries where they don't do circumcision uh, originally, and uh, maybe the second wife uh, would prefer a circumcised um, husband. Uh, very, very, social, very intimate sort of um, history you take from patients and very important in this setting to make the patient feel absolutely at ease. Those patients come with very interesting um, myriad of uh, specification. To start with, urology lists come with like males and females. So it's not only males and um, it's not like an andrology list. Uh, they also come from any age you can imagine. It can be a kid with a hypospadias, for example, or it could be like a 90 years uh, gentleman coming for a, a redo of his prostate. Generally speaking, the majority of patients are fit and healthy. Even you'll find that the elderly, if they have some health issues, they're not really going to impact massively on your anesthetic because most of the procedures are pretty much quick. So very unlikely that you will need to cancel a case. One of the um, very important factors that uh, we discussed and, uh, and emphasized repeatedly in this talk is the patients are absolutely anxious, like terribly anxious, because that part of the body is important and it, it's very private to them, and uh, they, they, really, they really feel vulnerable, absolutely vulnerable and violated. So what, what, what we usually um, ensure that they get on the day is lots of TLC, lots of tenderness, love, and care. So showing them that we care and being utterly considerate to um, their needs. There are some practical points that I would like to uh, share with you guys today. One of them is, and we'll go through them one by one. The first one is being gender considerate. So for example, if you're doing um, a, a procedure, a TORPT, trans, trans um, urethral resection of a bladder tumor for a lady who is a smoker, and you notice that you are a male uh, anesthetist and you have a male um, an aesthetic technician giving you a hand and there is a male scout nurse in the room that's too much testosterone in the room. Maybe you get one of the uh, females, like a, a student nurse or a nurse from another place, just to kind of hold the patient's hand and make her feel at ease and vice versa as well. If a male patient and being put to sleep by a female uh, anesthetist and a female nurse he feel very uncomfortable, as in utterly uncomfortable, and very important to have a male sort of balance, like get the estrogen and testosterone balanced in the room to make the, 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 the patient comfortable. Very important, very important. Goes miles with patients. Um, and um, the, the next point about the, um, the, the, the uh, practical points is the transrectal ultrasound um, biopsy of the prostate. Uh, some people do that for, under, for awake patients, or some people just give a sedation. I'm really intrigued to know how everyone does it, because in my hands, I give them a light GA, because the probe, which is kind of the size of a big cucumber, quite big cucumber, would go through the anus and get the photo from the um, from the, from the prostate, not only this, but after putting this wedge in the back passages, there is always a, also a gun going repeatedly to get the sample. So it can be very, very uncomfortable for patients. And um, I personally would like to have a GA if I'm having this procedure. And that's what I offer my patients. Also, the next practical point is uh, patients who are having circumcision or penile um, procedure for hypospadias or whatever, very, very important 
to be considerate to their pain. So penile block or ring block comes as standard giveaway for those patients in my hands because they, it's very uncomfortable for patients to have pain down there. The next point is when um, I do the uh, TRP under uh, uh, like TERB patients under spinal, uh, even some patients might say, yeah, I don't want sedation. I'm happy. Just make the lower part of my body numb. I offer them the, the sedation because honestly, no one needs to remember this. It's quite traumatic for many patients. And that's why I, I, I in my hands, I offer the, the, uh, the sedation as kind of uh, complementary with the spinal, unless the patient really refuses that. So then at the end of the day, we respect the patient's wish. You will find interestingly, like the elderly um, patients, like 80 plus, um, they, like to, they like to remember things and they like to have a story to tell afterwards. So those patients, I accept their wish and I don't give them, them the sedation. Next point we're going to talk about is the gentamicin. Usually those patients will get quite a big dose of gentamicin, 320, uh, milligrams and sometimes even 400 milligrams of uh, gentamicin. Very, very important to give that as a very slow infusion. So whatever dose you're giving, I usually give it over an hour. And that's important to ensure that the gentamicin level don't, don't go very high and cause some sort of sensory deafness. Remember at the end of the day, these patients in their age group are probably hard of hearing. And um, in one of the papers that I've read, it was amazing that the hearing loss actually in humans start when you hit 50. So I personally probably have a degree of that. And um, it then escalates slowly through the years and then get, like, we get a massive loss of hearing when we, when we turn um, 80 plus. So very important to be considered for any, um, in, any, any side effects that we could expose our patients to. <clears throat> at the end of the day, we do no damage. Um, the last point on the list is some patients who are having prostatectomy and they have some pain issues and uh, those who have um, like um, uh, ra radiation implants for a prostate, like it's a technique to, to treat prostate cancer, these can have some pain issues afterwards. So some of the suggested techniques is to do the spinal with some intrathecal morphine, which is 100 micrograms added to the 15 mics of fentanyl and um, whatever heavy marking is being used in the spinal combination. So I'll be intrigued to know what's the consensus and whether someone has, uh, one of you guys has considered uh, to use intrath intrathecal morphine in this context. That pretty much concludes um, most of the, the talk. And we'll go now into the next point of reflection about the trust biopsy. So uh, I'll be interested to know, and please share your um, experience openly. How do you conduct an anesthetic episode of care for transrectal ultrasound biopsy of the prostate? Do you do that? as an awake patient, just to flip the list and keep the list going, fine, no issues. Or do you do some tiny sedation? Um, or do you rather uh, believe that you could do a quick mini spinal and get the patient comfortable, plus or minus sedation, whatever? In my hands, I give them general anesthesia, light general anesthetic, quick to make sure um, they're comfortable and they have no recollection of the trauma. So please feel free to share your, your opinion. That is utterly impressive. That is utterly impressive that uh, many people would do a quick spinal. Uh, I, I, I don't do that, uh, but I suppose my urologist doesn't have enough patient, patient, not patient, uh, no, sorry, doesn't have enough patience to wait for my patients to have their spinal. So unless you're very sleek with your spinal, um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. And I suppose one of the aims of this talk is to have a discussion and see 
what everyone uh, does different technique. At the end of the day, many of us practice as solo practitioners and these opportunities and these talks are very important for us to exchange experiences. The fourth and the final reflection now um, would be um, about uh, intrathecal morphine uh, for TURB patients. So have you ever considered or used intrathecal morphine uh, for TURP patients uh, as in 100 micrograms added to your um, spinal mix? Option A is yes, I have, or option B is no, I have never done it and I don't want to do it. Very impressive. Um, the majority, 68%, never done it. Um, maybe something to consider. Uh, surely it is backed by lots of um, uh, articles in the literature. Uh, I'll be interested in the discussion to see those who does it, why do they agree with me? <clears throat> and those who don't, uh, what's their rationale? So it was really amazing to share my experiences with you. Thank you guys. Shukran, Gazilan, Grazie, Dankeschön, Sas, Efharisto, Danke, Gracias, and there is one good reason why I didn't say it in French, but it's personal reason anyway. Thank you so much. Discussion is open, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, you just open a window for the discussion for the urology procedures. Uh, I will start by myself first. Uh, uh, what do you mean by quick spinal anesthesia? And the, and the expression of light general anesthesia, this expression light general anesthesia is confusing because as we all know, the way uh, the, the word light, so maybe the patient may be susceptible to reflexes and so on and so on. So can you explain briefly what do you mean by this and that? Quick Thank you so much. Very, very good question. Very good question. It's two parts Thanks. the question. Uh, for the um, for this uh, quick spinal or the mini spinal, in my institute, we have a package with everything in the spinal. Is You know, like um, rapid sequence induction or crash trolley, we have a package of all the spinal stuff ready. So if the patient's coming for a quick, say, cat one Caesar, or you want to do a spinal quickly, you just open the back, has everything in it, the, 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 um, the, the, 20, the 25 needle and everything in it basically. So you open it, you do it quickly. It takes around five minutes to do that and that doesn't compromise all the other stuff, which is the consent IV access, monitoring, positioning, local anesthetic, but there is no time wasted in getting the, um, the items to do, like the local anesthetic and the needle, and all the, uh, um, the alcohol swaps, everything is ready packaged in that um, quick spinal package. So that's what I meant by quick spinal. As for a light GA, I suppose I meant uh, not using a long acting uh, opiates. So a light GA in my hands will be something like 100 of fentanyl and an induction dose of propofol and, and just continue on SIVO at a MAC of 0.7.8. So the patient is not aware. Definitely, there is no awareness. And um, I don't usually use BIS for these quick procedures. But if, if it's available um, liberally in the, in, in the institution I'm working in, I would use the BIS and I'll keep the BIS monitoring or the entry entry monitoring somewhere around 60. So that is a light plane of general anesthetic. We know that anesthetic, general anesthetic and sedation is kind of a continuum. So the, the more we give, the, 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 the more we um, drift towards uh, general anesthetic. But with like uh, general anesthetic, I, I, I precisely mean avoiding any long acting um, uh, opiates. So no morphine, just a quick maybe fentanyl or even alfentanyl sometime if I trust that the urolog urologist is sleek with his technique and he will get the, the biopsy quickly. I hope that answered the question. Oh yeah, yeah. thank you. But did you intubate the patient or use a supraglottic device or you don't need? No, you, you, usually, LMAs, usually LMAs, usually LMAs. LMA. Yeah, okay. usually a laryngeal mask and an eye gel. So by the time I have given the induction, 
uh, and the patient, I, I usually actually do that in a uh, lift lateral position. So there is no even time wasted in repositioning the patient. The patient lie on the lift lateral position and he gets induced in that position. And on the side, while the patient is on the side, we slide the LMA and that gets the urologist to fiddle with whatever he's doing and gives us time to get okay. ready for the next patient. It's really one of the very high turnover lists. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, any one of our ban list uh, want to share? Because it's still someone have some questions more, but let us, uh, if you want to share, or we'll continue. We will continue. About the intrathecal uh, morphine and intrathecal fentanyl. Uh, we have an idea, or what's called, from uh, what, when we're junior staff, about the late, so respiratory complication of intrathecal morphine. You know the, so the rate, the turnover of these patients are very, are very high, it's very high in Egypt. It's too much patient over there. So you are putting the patient out and so on. So yeah, maybe the post-operative monitoring is not up to the level in some areas. So most of us prefer to use fentanyl, 25 mic fentanyl. Uh, I think this is uh, a, why we are not using, uh, or most of us not using uh, morphine, intrathecal morphine. Anyone has some else or some opinion else or something? I, I don't know. Anyone of the band list has another uh, idea or what do you think uh, about I, that? I, I, personally use the intra I, I personally use the intrathecal morphine if there is other issues with the patient, like if he, uh, he or she is having some chronic pain issues, or if they had uh, the radi radiation implantation, like, like they get like 40 or 60 little implants uh, of cesium, yeah. I think, in the, in the prostate. And they, can, they need to lie in bed for quite a long time for that to work and not moving. And that can make them uncomfortable. So it's, it's, it's this situation where I use the intrathecal morphine. So I don't use it liberally, but it's something that I always have up my sleeve to use in my armamentarium. And I'll be interested to, need the, to, to know opinion from, um, from attendees, whether it's with or against. There's no, yeah. there's no right or wrong answer. Yeah, sure, sure. Would, would you like me to, uh, I, I'd like to give a comment if, it, if the time permits, yeah. uh, Prof. Mohamed yes, Abrahim. Sure, sure, sure. For her. Yeah, so um, in my institution and according to our hospital uh, policy and procedure in, in my hospital, Indeed, if you want to give any intrathecal narcotics, either, either fentanyl or morphine or anything, you have to have two things in your hand. Granny citrone, because of the itching, is sometimes killer, and this is an only complaint post-operative for the patient, and it's really annoying to have that kind of itching. So on and citrone and, and, and granny citrone are completely different. Nausea and vomiting as well. Second thing here in, in my institution again, or in Ireland as general and in the matter hostel in particular, if you're giving any intrathecal uh, morphine, you have to have, to have a post-operative high dependency unit bed to keep respiratory monitoring at least for 18 yes. to 24 hours. I don't know yes. about your perception of that, Dr. Walid. Uh, my perception, I, I agree with you, and we have pretty much the same guidelines. It's interesting that uh, some of the um, younger generations now, and I'm saying younger like in the 40s, are having some blood uh, um, prostate issues. And those patients have, unfortunately, very high uh, analgesic requirements, either because of uh, like earlier, earlier or current drug abuse, so, like, we, we live in, in an era where many people are abusing um, drugs at the moment. So, it's, it's considered to give them the intrathecal morphine. And those young people are not at high risk of having, um, of ha of having a, 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 um, a, a, the, uh, the respiratory depression afterwards. I will be definitely very mindful if the patient is an elderly, but the patients in the 40s range or having prostate problem or some drug independent sort of issues, I would just treatment as normally as we do with the obstetric population. All obstetric population on the other hand, and which is the other side of the argument, all the obstetric population in all 
the institutes in Melbourne would give would get the 50 15 mics of fentanyl and 100 mics of uh, morphine intrathecal and none of them go to HDU because they are young fit healthy and um, the amount of pain is is paramount so uh, some of the patients are carefully selected to get the intrathecal morphine but I agree with with the guidelines that you have and we have the same here in, in place in Melbourne as well okay thank you Dr. Walid I know some question from uh, Dr. Saeed Ahmed he asked about uh, about what what do you think about an extreme trend Lemberg position during the laparoscopic uh, uh, prostate more than five hours. What's your opinion about that? The uh, reverse trend Lemberg? Extreme, extreme trend Lemberg for laparoscopic prostatectomy, but prolonged for more than five hours. I think maybe he saw a case like that and he needs to, to know the opinion about that. Sure, sure. On, on, there is there is a myriad of issues here. Probably the, the the most evident is the mechanical one, and that's why we use what's called sand bags. So the sand bag is put under the patient and um, has like two arms of it coming from the shoulder to stop them from sliding down. And this sand bag is suctioned, so the patient is kind of uh, like screwed to the table and not at risk of falling. So that's a mechanical component. The other component would be the pressure on the, uh, on the lungs. And uh, I would always use a very high peep here, like maybe a peep of eight or 10 yeah. with, the, with the tube to ensure that the patient's res res respiratory uh, function is not compromised in any way. Uh, it is a bonus to have them kind of uh, head down so you can have more venous return. And it does help to minimize the fluid requirements for those patients anyway. Um, sometimes when we do that, we kind of break the bit a little bit. So yes, they have the head down, but not very down. It's a little bit um, flattish, if that makes sense. So there are definitely considerations for that, but it's absolutely doable and there's no problem with it. Uh, uh, there's also some uh, tiny logistic issues about making sure that the venous return is, is, is freely moving. So uh, not tighten the tube uh, uh, like uh, the endotracheal tube too much and ensuring that the 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 uh, ventilation is adequate so there is no much uh, um, cerebral blood flow thank you thank you uh, another question from uh, Sharif Ah uh, uh, Abdul Latif and Muhammad Salim about the QRP surgery uh, what how can we opt to uh, block what's called the obturator reflex during QRP? I'm Did you sorry. I didn't I'm hear sorry, about that. You, I'm sorry, you can't. For all my years of anesthetics, I just could not find an answer for it. And it's actually embarrassing. But I think one of the things is to tell the urologist, and many urologists actually know yeah. that it is that reflex because the patient, the patient will be suddenly moving legs and the knees are going to hit the head of the urologist. And, and, and they think that the patient is light. Um, uh, in my hands, I, I have no solution for it. Just explanation to the urologist and communication yeah. to the team. And that's probably one good reason why I give them the, the, the sedation with the spinal as well. So they don't remember uh, anything. So this is the answer for the uh, second solution. Uh, second solution. Uh, what, did, what do you prefer for the TRB? Uh, what technique, anesthetic technique? And if you use a spinal, you use spinal alone with, or with the, I think with sedation, that. so a spinal with sedation is, is preferred, but do you prefer uh, spinal or general or, or another technique? Well, the literature says now that the, traditional, the traditionally held belief that spinal is superior to GA is not warranted anymore. So uh. you can do spinal or you can do GA. But in my hands, anyone who gets a spinal for his private parts would have to have a, a, like a freebie, like a bonus of sedation, unless they refuse that. So no one need to remember the experience. It can be traumatic to some people, even though if they put a very brave face. So my preferred technique is spinal 
plus sedation. And I think uh, in the urology setting, it's actually great to get the trainees to do lots of spinals in that list because they don't get this opportunity in other lists, especially in lists like, like um, joint replacement lists. They would have maybe one spinal a day or two spinals a day. But in a urology list, they can have four or five spinals in one day. Okay, thank you. Last question about back to the transrectal, recta, uh, transrectal biopsy, ultrasound rectal biopsy. If the saddle block is reasonable for that technique, what do you think? Saddle block. Uh, I don't think urologist, I mean saddle block by the anesthetist or by urologist? This is Dr. Sharif Abdel Latif asked about that saddle block. I don't well, know, I think we, we, we will undo it. I think we, uh, I, I, I have not done it myself. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think saddle block would, would be more cumbersome to do and takes more time for a procedure that's not painful afterwards. We need a very yeah. short, quick anesthetic that's deep enough that the patient doesn't remember it, but not too deep and not too cumbersome to perform. So pretty much the quick answer for this is, no, I wouldn't suggest it and I wouldn't recommend it. It's just too cumbersome. Unless it's for teaching experience or for uh, research, maybe it's worth it. But for routine, uh, like high turnover list wouldn't be the best option yeah. for me. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Professor. Absolutely or? fantastic work. Thank you.